Life Stories Live. Another life story from Life Stories Worldwide. It's great to have you with us, some regular people and also new people. And especially we give greetings to the people in Ukraine. We want to tell you we're praying for you and we pray God's blessing upon you all. Tonight, we have a, a guest speaker from the northeast of England. I'm going to introduce him to you in a moment. But uh, let me just uh, tell you that if you need help, then please contact us on our hotline. Uh, you can see that on your screen. And you can go to our website, lifestoriesworldwide.com. And there you'll find lots of information of, uh, about the, the work that we're doing. So tonight, as I say, we have a guest from the northeast of England, Michael Bushby. Michael is from Gateshead. In the uh, eight, 19, early 1980s, he joined the Metropolitan Police in London as a, a police constable. And in the late 1980s, he uh, changed his job and he became a trained crew instructor and assessor. He probably explained to you what that involves. And then during the spring of 2013, Michael was diagnosed with uh, incurable uh, cancer. But he'll tell you all about what's happened to him and how God has led him in his life. So I'm going to hand over to you now. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for giving me the privilege of sharing my story at Easter. I love Easter. I love everything about Easter. But what I love most about Easter is the Easter message. The Easter message is so outrageous that it's a message filled with hope and love. It's a message about a man called Jesus who came to earth 2,000 years ago and dwelt among us. And while he was here, he went about doing good. He healed the sick. He cast out demons. He raised the dead. He gave sight to the blind. He calmed the storm. He turned water into wine. He fed at least 5,000 people. Yet he was crucified. And three days later, he conquered death. He conquered the grave. And he rose again. Jesus is risen. The victory is won. Sins are forgiven. Praise God for his son. Amen. So my name is Michael Bushby. I'm 59 years old. I'm a city centre a a city centre chaplain in Newcastle, where I've served since 2008. I'm a trustee for an overseas ministry uh, in Malawi, and I'm also a regional director for Christian Vision for Men. Tonight, my testimony is about saying thank you to God for what He's done in my life. It's about saying thank you, Jesus, for what You continue to do in my life, and thank you, Jesus, for what You can do in your life. So what I'd like to do is I would like to share my story in three stages. I'd like to take you right back to the beginning and I'd tell you what my life was like before I became a Christian. I'd like to share with you how I became a Christian. And I'd also like to talk about how becoming a Christian has transformed my life. I'd also like to share with you my battle with incurable cancer and how my faith has helped me. But before I do any of that, I'm going to read a scripture to you. Now, I've chosen this scripture because it's a scripture that gave me a lot of comfort and strength when I was battling cancer back in 2013. It's from Jeremiah 29, verse 11 to 14. And it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me. And I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. Amen. Let me pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you for your love. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to share my story tonight. And I pray, Lord God, as I share my story, you will speak through me. I pray, Lord God, that you would be honoured in all that I say. 
And I pray, Lord God, tonight that lives would be healed, lives would be touched, and people would come to know that you are real, that Jesus is alive. Oh, Jesus, I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So if I can take you right back to the beginning, I grew up on a council estate right in the centre of Gateshead, and my father was a truck driver, and my mother worked in industry. I have a younger brother, and I have a twin brother. And growing up for us was very, very tough. It was very, very challenging, because my dad was quite a violent man. He was quite an aggressive man, quite an abusive fella. He was a heavy gambler. He was a smoker. And he was a heavy drinker. And we knew nothing but violence. My dad would often come home after losing money on the horses and he would assault me mum. Or he would throw meals up the wall. And quite often we, 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 we would witness me mum being tortured by me dad. On one occasion he came home and he ripped the shirt from my mother's back. And we stood up to me dad and we were assaulted. So we knew nothing but violence. He was a violent dad, a dad whom I loved and respected, but he was very, very violent. And we were challenged by that psychologically. It did a lot of damage to me and my brother. And uh, we got ourselves involved in petty crime. Uh, I was in the shoplifting. Uh, my brother and I, we joined a gang called the Chandis Estate Agro Boys. And often we'd go out of the nighttime after school and we'd fight neighbouring estates with sticks and change. So we knew nothing but a life of violence. Anyway, I went through school and left with barely a qualification, and I couldn't wait to get out there into the big bad world. And the first job I got was in a, an abattoir warehouse. It was my job to carry freshly slaughtered animals off the vans and load them into the warehouse. And I did that job six days a week from six in the morning till six at night. I did that job for about 18 months. And one day I came home and I wept and I cried. And I said to my mum, I can't do this anymore. I don't want to work with dead animals. It was an awful job. I come home most nights soaked through to the skin with blood off these animals. And I said to my mum, can I give my job up and go back to college? And my mum said, well, I'll support you. If that's what you want to do, I will support you. Now, back then it was a big deal because money was tight. We didn't have a lot of money. As I said before, my dad was a heavy gambler. Quite often he'd leave my mother short of money. So it really was a big deal for me to give up my job 
and go back to college. And that's exactly what I did. I went to college and I stuck in for about a year and a half. And I left college with a boatload of O levels. And so when I left college, I decided to leave home and go down to London. And while I was in London, I joined the police. I joined the Metropolitan Police. I served two years in uniform at Holloway Police Station. And from Holloway, I went over to Highbury and I joined the task unit. It was a subdivision to the CID and we used to do all the donkey work for the CID. We do all the drugs observations and all the drugs busts. We collate evidence and pass all the information over to the CID. But while I was in London, I got attracted to the world. I became a womanizer. I slept around with different women. I was out drinking and clubbing most nights. And I was really steeped in the world. I remember on one occasion, I went to a pub called The Punch and Judy right in the center of London in Covent Garden. And there was a guy in the toilet, he was peddling drugs, he was peddling cannabis. And he offered me some cannabis. And I threw me police warrant card in his face and I gave him two options. Option one, hand the drugs over to me. Or option two, I'll arrest you. And the guy turned around to me and says, well, what are you going to do with the drugs? And what I said to him was, I'll repeat this. Option one, you hand the drugs over. Or option two, I'll arrest you. So he gave me the drugs, which probably had a street value of about, about a thousand pound back then. And off he legged it out of the pub. And guess what? I went back to the police section house and I told me mates what I'd done. And I was quite popular. All my mates wanted to come and see me and get a bit of cannabis from me. So I guess back then police corruption was rife. Uh, we certainly don't have the technology. We didn't have the technology that we do back now, uh, here now. So there was a lot of corruption in the police back then. Anyway, after several years in London, the job was becoming a way of life. I was living with police, I was socialising with police, I was working with police, and I decided to take a career break and return to the Northeast. So I came back to the Northeast and met my wife. I got married. Three years later, I had my first daughter. And then two years later, I had my second daughter. And life was going great. I got a job on the Tyne Weir Metro as a revenue control inspector. And then eventually I went into work one day and they were advertising for train crew. So I applied for the job. I went off for all the assessments, the aptitude tests, and I was accepted. And life was going great. I went into management. I then became a train crew instructor, a train crew assessor. So it was my job to assess drivers to make sure that they were driving to rail group standards. I was also involved in the training department, so I would deliver training to new drivers. So everything was going really well for me. Anyway, whilst at work, I was at work one day driving a train. I met a lovely guy called Bob Arkley. And Bob used to walk the tracks. He, was, he worked for the P-Way department. And it was job, Bob's job to maintain the tracks. So I was driving the train this day, and I passed Bob, and I sounded the horn. And he gave me a wave. And he moved to the side of the track. And I would see this guy quite a bit walking the tracks. And he had something about him. He had a presence about him. There was just something about Bob that attracted me. One day I got talking to Bob in the staff room. And I said to him, I really was fond of him. I was attracted to him. And he told me that he was a Christian. He told me all about his life, about how he'd been in the Navy about how he'd been a womanizer, about how he liked alcohol. And he met this guy called Jesus who transformed his life. And he asked me if I'd like to come to church with him. So I accepted Bob's offer and I went along to a house church in South Shields. That was in 1993. And while I was at the house church, I met some lovely people. I was really warm to these people. They were full of love. There was just a presence in the house. And Bob's church leader came up to me and he asked me if I'd like to become a Christian. 
Well, it seemed perfectly natural to accept that invitation. So that night, I accepted Jesus as my personal saviour. I invited Jesus into my life. And that was the start of my journey as a Christian. And what happened that night, it was quite powerful. It was quite supernatural. Because I went back home and I lay down in bed. And I thanked Jesus for coming to my life. I gave a simple prayer. And it went something like this. Thank you, Lord, that I have found you. Thank you, Jesus, for coming into my life. And what happened was beyond words. I can sit here all night and I'll probably never do it justice. But just for a split second, just for what seemed a microsecond, my body was bathed in an explosion of light. stories live a pure white explosion of light and with it i felt energy there was a tingling sensation around my body and i knew i'd met jesus that night i knew i'd met my savior and that was a, that was the start of my transformation and so what i did was i joined the church a local church i got involved with the house groups i got involved with the bible studies and I became devoted, a devoted follower of Jesus. In 2008, I became a city centre chaplain in Newcastle, where I still serve to this day. And my job in Newcastle is to go out there and to give pastoral care and love to people in the workplace who have problems. So life was going quite good for me. And then guess what? And on the 1st of May 2013, the brakes came on. My life was turned upside down. I was given a diagnosis of stage four incurable cancer. Stage four incurable cancer. I was told by the consultant that they couldn't cure the cancer and that eventually the cancer would kill me. The cancer had spread from my lymphatic system into my bone marrow. I had a large tumor in my spleen and I also had a tumor in my stomach. So what we agreed on was a course of chemotherapy. So I embarked upon a course of strong chemotherapy for three months. And during that time, I ended up in hospital with an infection. I felt quite sick. I lost my hair. I lost a lot of weight. And it was a terrible experience. It was quite traumatic. So three months into the treatment, the consultant decided to send me for some scans. And I was called into hospital about a week later and I sat down and I looked at the consultant in the eyes. And she says, I have some bad news for you. The treatment you've been on hasn't worked. At that instant, I became very angry with God. I was quite dismayed. I had people praying for me all over the country all over the world. I'd always believed in a God of miracles, a God of healing, 
The Bible says by his stripes we are healed. The Bible says that nothing is impossible when we turn to God in faith. And that's exactly what I was doing. I was exercising my faith. I was believing that God was going to be near me. I had enlisted the support of prayer people from all over the world. And yet I was given this dreadful news. The treatment hadn't worked. So what I did was I left hospital and I jumped on the number 56 bus and I decided I was going to end it. I went to a Weatherspoons pub in Gated and I sat there and I got drunk. I sat there feeling very, very sorry for myself. And the more I drank, the more the enemy began to whisper lies to me. You're dying, you're dying, just end it. And that's exactly what I wanted to do that night. I left the pub and I started home. I went into the garage with a rope and I slammed the door shut. And I had one more beer in my hand. I'll have one more beer and I'll end it. I'll have one more beer and I'll end it. I don't want to die this death of cancer. I may as well finish it. And do you know what? God spoke to me that night. He spoke to me through my wife and through my two daughters because they were brain frantically on the garage door. Please come out, Dad. Come out, Dad. We're going to call the police. If you don't come out, we'll call the police. And my wife was begging me to come out. And suddenly I heard God's voice. I heard the, God, the voice of God speak through my wife and two daughters. I thought, how can I just give it all up? How can I just abandon something that God's blessed me with? The most precious things in my life, my wife and two daughters. And so I came out of the garage and I wept and I wept and I cuddled them and I told them how sorry I was. And off I went to bed that night and I cried before God. And I got up the next day and I told God how sorry I was. And I repented and asked him to forgive me for ever doubting him. And I said, God, whatever time I have left, I just lay it all before you. I just lay my life before you. If you want to take me home, Lord God, so be it. But I give whatever time I have left, I give it to you. And I just pray you will use my life and use it for your glory. And instantly, the fear of death left me. The fear of cancer that left me. And I've never feared death since that day. I've never feared cancer since that day. And I've been living with this incurable cancer for nine years. Nine whole years. And you know something? God has used me incredibly. I've been on a wonderful journey with the Lord because when I finished the treatments eventually, I took a call from a guy called Richard Trotter. Richard is a director for Reba Ministries in Malawi and he rang me and he told me about a ministry called Christian Vision for Men. Richard started telling me about men in church, men leaving the church, suicide amongst men. And the statistics that Richard was sharing with me were quite grim and ugly. And so I, I asked Richard to come to my house and deliver a presentation. And I arranged for local church people to come to my house to hear this message. That night, there was 12 men, 12 church leaders came to the house and Richard Trotter from Derbyshire delivered a, a message about Christian vision for men. He delivered a message about men in church, men leaving church, men in suicide. And when he left, I was quite alarmed and I wanted to do something. When we noticed to Richard, he'd sown seeds, he'd sown seeds in my heart. And I wanted to pick up the baton and do something. I wanted to reach out to these men, these men who had suicidal tendencies, because I'd been there myself. I have the T-shirt. And so what I did was I spoke to my local church leader and asked him if we could have a meeting. Life Stories. Stories Live.